Hello, everyone, and welcome to this, the second installment of the African Startup Investment Summit series. That's quite a, quite a mouthful. mouthful. We, we hope you're well, and we hope you're adjusting to the new norms of our world. Speaking of which, it's funny, when I was, uh, when I was thinking about the title for today, uh, Investing in Uncertain Times, I asked myself the question, do early stage investors ever invest in times of certainty? Yes, we're in a state of limbo in many ways, and yes, the world doesn't seem to be positive, but the very nature of the blanket restrictions that we're all currently subject to, the increased health risks, and the inevitable ripple effects on society and our economies render these times in a rather paradoxical way more certain than most others. So the question then becomes, what can we control? And this, ladies and gentlemen, is really the essence of our series. My name is Rajiv Daya, and I manage the investment and fundraising process for our growing portfolio at Founders Factory Africa. And for those of you who haven't come across the brand, we're an African venture building group. We're backed by Africa's largest corporates. We're powered by a dynamic team of sector specialists or operators. We're Pan-African. We focus on tech-enabled startups, specifically fintech and health tech, and we're global in our reach, leveraging a multi-continental presence. Our event co-hosts, Africa Arena, who many of you may know from their successful tech summit at the end of each year in Cape Town, are equally committed to, to connecting promising tech entrepreneurs across Africa with corporates and investors through open innovation challenges and events across the continent. At the end of last year, they convened a, a group of uh, various African investors to discuss the state of play. And there were some really tangible outcomes that arose from that gathering, some of which we'll be discussing next week. And just like our colleagues at Africa Arena, we are fixated on this idea of harnessing the power of the collective. And it's in that spirit that we've come together to carefully construct a narrative across the series that commenced last week with a focus on the agility of startups in times of crises and the extent to which they're being supported by their investors. For those of you who, who missed it, uh, you're more than welcome to watch the replay, which is on YouTube. Today, we take that forward and focus on how investors are being supported by their investors. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Next week, we turn our attention to what we as a collective are doing to make the African ecosystem more fluid and more dynamic from an investment perspective. But as the saying goes, talk is cheap, and we want to do more than that. So as you'll hear from the speakers today, they're acting. And similarly, we're not here to speculate, but rather to create tangible outcomes. And in that regard, for those who joined us last week, you'll remember that we announced the use of the Eurocco T platform to match the demand and supply of risk capital. We announced the African Digital Collective, which is the online resource tailored to startups specifically. And we've also arranged virtual pitches, some of which you will see today. And the whole idea behind that is in a conference-free world, we will still have the ability to showcase exciting businesses across the continent. And finally, we'll be talking about deal-specific documents and regulatory interventions next week. As we move into the first panel discussion, I think it's important to provide a layer of context as far as the venture capital <laughs> ecosystem is concerned. As many of the listeners may not be familiar with the flow of capital. And what's interesting when you think about it is that founders and investors, and I'm gonna use the, the, the terms VCs and fund managers interchangeably here for investors, What's, what's interesting is that these two groups have more in common than you may think. Fund managers or VCs are sometimes seen as too tough or unwilling to support earlier stage businesses, but we need to be very, very clear about something. Just like founders go to VCs and ask for money to grow a business over time and deliver a return, so too do those very same VCs go to their investors, known as limited partners, to raise money, to grow businesses, and to deliver a return. So the flow of capital, to be very clear, is from LP to VC to startup. In the African context, these LPs are largely development finance institutions or large financial institutions such as asset managers. The reason I mention this is because it's not solely at the discretion of a fund manager or VC to decide 
who supports an ecosystem and invests in early stage businesses, but rather a collective investment decision. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the relationship that we're exploring today. So I'm going to hand over to Esther Ndeti, who is the Executive Director at the East Africa Venture Capital Association, which is East Africa's largest network of private capital investors, representing over 100 firms with over $5 billion in assets under management. Before I do that, I'd like to ask all of you listening to please use the chat function on the webinar to send through any questions you may have for our panelists this afternoon. Esther Karibusana. Thank you, Rajiv, and thank you to the team at Africa Arena and Founders Factory Africa for inviting me to this session. Um, I'm delighted to guide today's discussion, which will focus on the relationship between limited partners and fund managers, and basically how investments can still be executed under the current COVID-19 environment. For this session, I am joined by three incredible speakers. Um, first being Ketso Gordon, who is a, who's currently the CEO of the SA SME Fund, which is the largest institutional investor in venture capital in South Africa. Having invested in existing VC funds, the SA SME Fund has additionally launched four new VC firms covering biotech, hardware and engineering, IP commercialization and digital innovation. Secondly, we have Kenza Lalu. Kenza is a co-founder and managing partner of Outliers Ventures, which is a seed investment fund uh, based out of Morocco, providing smart capital to African tech-enabled startups. And last and certainly not least, we have Larry McCarthy, who is the head of strategic investments and alliances for the Standard Bank Group. His role includes investing in companies on behalf of Standard Bank, as well as the global search for technology companies of varying sizes that will provide Standard Bank with solutions to service its range of clients across its operations. So a huge welcome to our three panelists um, this afternoon. Um, I'll just also remind the attendees to please share your questions as we go along the discussion. Don't, not, don't wait to the end. Or we'll, I'll be happy to incorporate your questions as we move along. Um, and I'll, before, you know, I'll kick this off with inviting the speakers to give brief opening statements on how each of them is currently dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and I'll start with Larry, please. Uh, Esther, thank you. Um, I think we've, uh, we've obviously had to look at two elements of, uh, of the investment environment. One is ensuring that the companies that we are already working with are sufficiently capitalized um, and that they, they're able to manage their developers and their, their workforce. And the second one is um, to look for those opportunities out in the marketplace where, uh, where we read trends moving towards both during and post COVID and to see if there are opportunities for us to invest in, in companies that we think will be uh, dynamic and resilient going forward as well. So it's a combination of I guess, protecting what we have and looking for those further opportunities going forward. Thank you, Larry. Kenza? Thank you, Esther. Um, so just to give a bit of background, as you said, we're an early stage VC fund um, based out of Morocco, but we're Africa focused. So we invest in four main markets, Morocco, Egypt, Nigeria, and Kenya. And we invest in tech-enabled companies that are leveraging technology to transform traditional businesses and in, in, in economies. So uh, the way that we've uh, reacted to, to, to this unprecedent, those, those unprecedented times is that first, of course, I look at our, our portfolio companies and try to help and assist in any ways we can. Uh, so we'll, of course, mainly focus on those who need help. Uh, and we're lucky that most of them have been um, our, because our fund, the fundamental of our investment thesis is to invest in, uh, fund in, in, in companies that are solving fundamental needs. Um, so hopefully those companies are, are growing in actually this time. And on, on the other side, in the same time, looking for those opportunities that will emerge from this crisis, because in any recession and crisis, there are new opportunities coming up. And it's also uh, a great time for VC fund managers to look out of, uh, for, the, for those opportunities and back the best companies.
Cazzo. <laughs> Thanks, Esther. Um, the South African SME Fund has done both VC and non-VC uh, fund of fund investments. On the VC side, what we have been finding is that three of our funds had a science and innovation bent. So the hardware fund, the biotech fund, and the university technology fund have found themselves busier than would, it would have been in a normal period because people are trying to source solutions to the current crisis. So they've actually been able to consummate and, and complete deals and they've had a much more sympathetic and supportive investment committee that understands the urgency of getting some of those deals done. So they've been very, very good uh, in terms of be being able to make progress. They've also been, two of, the, two of them have also managed to close further funding for their funds. Again, for the same reason, people want to be seen to be supportive of fund managers that are trying to find solutions to the current crisis. For the, the other funds, I think it's been pretty much business as usual, except a lot, lot slower. And they've all struggled to complete DD via Zoom or uh, complete funding arrangements because many of the DFIs who are considering funding have put it on hold at least for the next month or two uh, to ride out this period of uncertainty. And as the fund, our, our little team has basically decided to utilize the skill and the knowledge we have to do two things as a priority. One is we are linking science innovators to funders, both in the, in the private sector and in the public sector. And the second thing is we have decided to raise a emergency debt fund uh, supporting one of the, 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 the provincial governments in South Africa, the Gauteng government, who have provided us with a 250 million rand first loss slice of capital, which we hope to gear up and uh, distribute via intermediaries to thousands of, of SMEs in the coming month. Thank you, Kathleen. Just to pick up on that point with regards to supporting um, fund managers, is this a trend we're seeing with LPs across the continent? Or is this something that's sort of, you know, limited to what you're doing as SA SME fund? And I know, Kenza as well, if you have any comments on this, what are the evolving conversations that have been happening between LPs and GPs over the past two to three months? Kenza, I'm going to let you go first. Well, Kitsu, I think you have the, the, the answer for that, but I'm happy to, to uh, give some feedback and in, insights of what's happening outside, because I think initiatives like the ones of Kitsu are very, very rare and very, very much needed in this kind of ecosystem. So really solving the problem at early stage for, for early stage funds that are investing at seed and before Series A, that's I think the most important uh, gap that we have in the, in the funding ecosystem in Africa. And fund managers are struggling to raise funding for this stage because GFIs are more focused on later stage uh, funds and large funds because they have a minimum threshold of tickets that they can invest that need to represent a certain percentage of the total fund size, which push funds managers to raise larger funds. However, when you raise a larger fund, then you have to, you, you will do mainly larger tickets. So Series A and B mainly. Uh, and, and unfortunately, um, those who are raising funds specifically for the seed stage are really, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's another, it's a real, real challenge. Um, however, we've seen, we've seen, um, some local funds of funds, um, some countries funds of funds. Uh, SI SME, SME fund is also uh, focusing on South Africa. Okay, so if you, yeah, I think that's the case for now. Uh, but those funds that I have seen that I've seen so far uh, would invest in funds that are um, only focusing on uh, one country, for example, like uh, the case in Morocco uh, or government-led. Fund of fund have lots of uh, that restrictions, so it's great that I, that exists, and they've been able to back three local VC funds. But those funds has to invest in companies that are incorporated in Morocco that are only, you know, uh, so they have many restrictions that are there's not uh, fitting the the vision for an, for Africa for investing in Africa VC because opportunities are, cannot be only limited to one country. It's exactly the same that we are saying to our entrepreneurs don't think it's only one market especially when it's a small market um and then uh, and then so that's that's uh, that's just something that is being 
um, have, have to change. And I think a lot of LPs are being, I don't say edu there is a, a lot of education that needs to still uh, be shared and insights and feedback that needs to be shared around that. And I, I would love to see more of uh, SISME fund in other markets and with the, with the regional or, or Pan-African um, dimension. So I would let Ketso say more about that. To be honest, I mean, we, we've actually learned a lot just by talking to our funds and seeing how they are dealing with their portfolio companies. And most of them have been incredibly supportive of their portfolio companies. Firstly, making sure that everybody is safe. Secondly, making sure that there's a plan for how to survive the next three to six months. They've, in most cases, have changed the, the funding uh, milestones, they've changed the use of capital, they've been very, very flexible to make sure that the portfolio companies are able to survive this period. So we, we've done a very similar thing in turn for our fund managers. So we've been in contact with our fund managers, making sure that we've been very supportive, helping them close some of the funding rounds that they were in the middle of. And like I said, most of it is coming from South African DFIs and corporates. The international DFIs have, have pretty much decided to wait until there's a lot more certainty. So we've been able to be supportive of our fund managers by giving them the flexibility. So if somebody needed to do debt instead of equity, they needed to blend or they needed to abridge, whatever was required, we were trying to be as flexible as they had been with their portfolio uh, uh, companies in order to, to support them to make sure that they survive this, this very difficult period and come out of it uh, able to continue with their, with their work. So Larry, um, Kenza mentioned there being um, more opportunities and more support for later stage businesses as opposed to startup businesses right now. What are your views on this um, during a period of this reduced liquidity and heightened uncertainty? Um, and what are your approaches with um, Standard Bank at the moment? I think that, that Kenza has raised a, a fundamental point. Um, the funding of, of businesses through the early rounds of um, angel uh, seed and, and pre, pre A round when uh, there's a lot more funding going on because the, the opportunities are already a lot more apparent is, is something that is absolutely essential to the whole continent. Um, I can't stress that enough. We, you know, if, if one looks at the countries that are in Africa that are starting to succeed in getting um, the ecosystems up and running to build new businesses, if one looks at some of the other markets in, in the Northern Hemisphere, the key to success is creating a fertile funding environment for early entrepreneurs to get access to not often not large amounts of money, but just for them to be able to flesh out their idea and start getting one or two customers on board, whether it's a consumer product or a, a business product, um, you know, one to one, one to many. But it, I would say if, if we were looking to solve one, one problem across the continent, it's uh, that dynamic support of early stage entrepreneurs to get them into, into viable business mode. Um, from a standard bank perspective, uh, to, to answer the second part of your question, um, so we are, we are present in approximately 20 countries. Um, we are obviously incredibly mindful of the fact that uh, the digital economy is, um, is, is dynamic, it's happening, people are building businesses. Um, the distances that are required to travel mean that, mean that uh, digital economies are more fundamental now than ever. Um, and it's not just about, in our space, it's not just about the financial services. There's digital enablement of education, there's digital enablement of healthcare, there's digital enablement of infrastructure. Um, and the fact that Africa has, has leapfrogged the world as far as mobile connectivity is concerned actually gives us an advantage in that space, which I think is something that we are yet to take full advantage of. 
All right. So within the context of the economic headwinds Africa is already facing, so this is both for Kenza and Larry, are you already including a potential 2020 downturn in your investment models? Or rather, are you modeling for a recession? Uh, what are some of the changes that you're doing towards your investment thesis? Um, well, so actually we have been accelerating our rhythm of investment um, and we have been doing deals in this period, especially in health tech, in fintech as well, and we're closing more deals coming up. So we've already closed two uh, in this past month and uh, doing more right now. Um, and I think in this time, so our thesis has always been built, as I said, uh, um, on investing in fundamental in businesses that are solving a fundamental problem and really an essential need so it has been i mean it's proven that it has worked well since in, in those times of crisis those are the businesses that stick and actually grow um, so it only confirms that it's the right approach to have but um, with, with in light with all the changes that we're witnessing of course we are looking at opportunities a bit differently so health tech is one of the, the sector that has been revealed. <laughs> so we were interested in this before, but I think in, in of course, in this time of crisis, of health issue, crisis, uh, it's a much needed uh, sector to be investing in and really solving a real problem and that will, will keep, will be there for a long time um, with or without the virus. And I think it's a very important um, mindset shift for people of how they um, how they, they they go to to their doctors and how they uh, take care of their health, but also in other sectors like fintech is very very important and interesting because it's the backbone of the economy, um, and digitizing this industry is also one of the biggest opportunities that we that has always been there but has been straight, uh, straightened in this uh, in this current situation. Um, so yeah, so we are not changing our, our investment thesis, but of course we are uh, directing it in um, toward those sectors that are the most interesting and we are learning and discovering every day. So it's very also um, interesting to see and, and see what how things are changing, how people's life is changing and witnessing the acceleration of uh, the, the digital transformation um, in, in emerging markets, especially, where people are now forced to use those new ways of consuming, of uh, learning, um, and, uh, and, and that pushes uh, the, the boundaries of innovation beyond, uh, forward. Um, Esther, thanks. From, from our side, the, um, our, our investment thesis, um, frankly, pre-COVID pre and where we are now, and uh, I imagine post-COVID, is along the lines of, of more financial inclusion. And I think um, what, what the, the COVID crisis has done is it's accelerated the need for financial inclusion. Um, it's driven a much firmer message across all the markets um, and it's it, in many instances it's exacerbated it to the point where people um, have to cut their decision time frames down considerably and move forward in a far more agile approach so I think that um, there's been a definite call to action as far as engaging with companies that can that can provide financial inclusion um, I think we've, we have an interesting uh, dynamic as being a banking group, uh, which would probably be different to, to the other co-panelists. And that is obviously uh, the central banks and the various reserve banks across the countries that we operate want to make sure that the financial services environment remains sound, uh, the balance sheets remain sound, and obviously our, our business as a bank is, is to lend money and in, in macroeconomic conditions like these, uh, our clients are going through different levels of, of pain. So we've had to balance uh, that together with new, new opportunities. And, uh, you know, we're in constant daily discussion around which opportunities to try and aim for that will have the greatest impact in terms of financial inclusion. Um, but we have to temper that and balance it against the uh, financial soundness of the system um, and the balance sheet that we have to use to support the system around us. 
Thank you both. So we have a number of questions coming in. I think one has been answered um, with regards to the sectors that are, that are hot right now. I think um, fintech, health tech, financial inclusion have been mentioned as some of the sectors being focused on currently. Um, but there's a question here with regards to finding opportunities outside COVID-based startup solutions. Um, are funds looking to invest in ideas or in businesses that are outside the, of this whole COVID um, you know, response um, businesses currently? Um, Kenza um, and also Ketso as well, I guess you can answer this. I mean, certainly uh, all our six funds in the VC space are open for non-COVID deals. And um, having looked through their current pipeline of deals that they are looking to invest in during this period, I would say still the over overwhelming majority are not COVID linked. We just happen to have three science focused funds. So each of them have ended up doing more COVID friendly uh, and supportive deals, but there, you know, they are definitely open for, for all types of businesses because we've got to think out of the box in this period about what's more sustainable, uh, what's going to create jobs, what solves the, the new problems that are emerging from this period. And, you know, as you correctly said, health tech, partic particularly sort of um, remote health solutions, ed tech solutions, particularly those that make uh, content available uh, offline rather than only online, are all becoming really, really important areas. And I can just say that from reviewing the pipeline of our, our funds, uh, there's, a, there's a very, very healthy spread of, of deals that are being looked at. Yes, I agree on this. Um, actually, it's not necessarily deals that are related to COVID because those companies have been existing before the crisis. Um, but those are the companies that the microeconomic environment is impacting positively. Uh, and it could be in health tech because, well, uh, they are solving some of the health tech issues, not directly COVID, but something related. I mean, that has been in, um, um, straightened by COVID crisis. Uh, or, for, for example, fin a financial uh, infrastructure layer that is needed to accelerate the transformation uh, of the financial sector. So it's not directly linked to COVID itself, but it's something that is needed to be able to, to, to go forward in the in the digital transformation of all traditional sectors. All right. I see a couple of questions here that addressed one that I had for you, um, the big L word, uh, liquidity. <laughs> so for several businesses, there, there's an immediate need for higher cash um, at the moment. And coupled with what seems to be a limited ability to, to fund these businesses, so in what ways are you optimizing your portfolio company's balance sheets ahead of an economic downturn? And this goes out to all three of you, and I'll start with Larry and then Ketso. Um, so I think it, it, it very much depends on the nature of the, of the company and um, how, how much of its um, team are, are, are fixed and how much of them are more on a contractual basis. Um, in, in some of the, the businesses that, that we've invested in that are focused on, on technology, um, you know, we've made sure that, that the key developers uh, have got the right level of, of funding behind them. Um, and if necessary, we've, we've laid out some capital to ensure that they've got the, the development roadmap that they need going forward. Um, some of the other companies in our portfolio are lending businesses, and obviously those are subject to the dynamics um, and stresses and strains of what's going on in, in the economy. And so we've had to approach each one of those companies um, with a bespoke solution. There isn't really a one-size-fits-all. Um, and it also depends on how far down the road they are from a revenue generation perspective and who their customer bases are. So some of our companies have seen increased turnover, revenue, cash generation, because they, they're operating with solutions that have been in high demand um, over, the, over the last uh, three months and growing probably over the next few months. Um, and others have seen a severe downturn and then 
you know, making sure that they've got sufficient cash on their balance sheet to weather the to weather the storm. I think what's what's vital, I suppose, just to answer it in one sentence is you can't uh, view every single company uh, with the same perspective. Each one has got its own uh, specificity, which we have to apply and decide how to take it forward uh, one case at a time. Yeah, just, just to add to that, I mean, as Larry said, some of, some of the businesses uh, in our portfolio fall into the category he described as having sufficient cash flow and are growing and are doing well despite the, the COVID crisis. So those are, are obviously uh, happy in the, in the current environment to continue pretty much on, on the track that they were. And in fact, some of them are even exceeding their revenue targets. But I would say uh, a significant number obviously have to be reanalyzed and you need to do a very detailed diagnostic to figure out what the future of that particular business is. So if the scenario shows that it has no potential to ever recover, you know, then I think it's, it has to be dealt with in, in a very specific way. What we have found through our fund managers uh, is that the majority require some, the ones that are not growing, require some level of help. And it requires a flexibility on the side of the fund manager, which we've been very supportive of. So moving out a revenue milestone uh, and providing the cash before the milestone has been achieved has been one of the most common interventions. The second one has been uh, changing the use of the capital that was provided. So in some instances, it was provided for, the, for capital goods and for equipment and now has to be used in smaller doses, but for operating uh, expenses. And we've allowed for that to happen. And I suppose in one or two of the more extreme cases, we've been able to provide some uh, measure of debt, which we know is uh, going to be able to repay, be repaid, but over a sort of 12 to 18 month period. So all of those three interventions for the businesses that are in that middle category where you're in trouble, but you know that there's a way out. The category A, which is you can do well because of the conditions. And then there's category three, unfortunately, where you have to shut the business down. Yeah, so just um, to add on this. Um, so in our case, they are, it depends actually on uh, the cash in hand uh, for the, those companies and how long uh, the, how how long is their runway? So um, we are. I mean, m most of our companies had just raised follow-on funding in Q1, or uh, have just closed their their new round. Uh, so we were lucky for that. But m some of them, like a minority of our companies, were in the middle, just preparing for fundraising. And those are the ones that uh, that would that are tr struggling right now. So, um, so I would say if a business has less than six months uh, cash in hand, then, I mean, in any case, in any case, even if you have a lot of cash in hand, I think the first advice is that um, it, it, entrepreneurs need to think of uh, cut, cutting costs. So this is like the number one in, in times of crisis when they're not growing and when their, their business has been negatively impacted. Um, by the situation, then it's uh, it really cost killing first uh, from the non-strategic ones to the strategic ones. So first starting, of course, with the all marketing expenses or anything that is not necessary to maintain the business so that they can they can strengthen then their, their runway. And that's very important. Um, and then for those who uh, have enough cash in hand, uh, so 12 months and uh, beyond, then for those, that's, that's another question. So if their business is, is growing, that's great. They, they, they will be able to, they're able to get revenue and still growing faster. And that's an opportunity. And they, they actually, the advice that we, we give is that they should take, um, they, they should actually use this cash in hand to hire uh, top people in the industry that will lose their jobs or, you know, so it's, a, it's also a, an opportunity for, to, to look at. Um, and then for those who are fundraising, then it's, it's, um, it depends. Uh, so I'd say entrepreneurs, the best thing is to do is to go back to the existing investors and try to, to raise a bridge, a bridge round. So that's, that's the, the first, 
thing because all VCs want their support for the company to survive and to keep up and to go beyond the crisis. So this is the number one. Uh, if they can do that, then yes, there are some debt capacities uh, and I've seen funds doing that. And we are actually helping our portfolio companies to access the debt capacities because there are programs in Africa that, that does that. Uh, that do that, like uh, the ABAN one, they did launch a, a program for debt capacity and they go, they source the, the starters from investors. So we refer our com portfolio companies and help uh, them through this process to get access to this capacity. Um, so yes, so I would say cascading and then trying to find external, uh, like that's bridge rounds from investors or debt capacity. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, and that's so that's businesses who are looking to sort of like uh, address their liquidity issues. I'm just curious, as as a fund, what are what is the practicality of due diligence in a COVID environment with all the lockdowns and limited movement and, you know, cash strapped businesses? Um, so, what's the pra practicality of due diligence as well as, um, you know, evaluations going to be impacted in this um, in this period as well? So that, that was it to Kenza. Okay. Um, so for the due diligence process, uh, yes, of course, uh, fund managers cannot travel anymore. And I guess in the next few months or a year, uh, there will be less, less travels than before. Um, so it, I, I think it mainly impacts first the late, later stage funds because they are investing big, big tickets, leading rounds, and they need to really spend time with their portfolio, with their potential invest, investee before, before doing that. For early stage funds, it's, it's easier because we co-invest a lot, we invest early, uh, and we have our referral network. So we are able to manage that and to do it via, uh, via Skype, and via, I mean, Zoom or like other, other ways. Uh, so we, and we have been used to, to that because uh, it's a different way of investing when you invest early stage. Um, so it depends. So I'd say it depends on the stage, it depends on the, the nature of the round and the nature of the business. But in any case, the due diligence has to be done and will be done, uh, it just a bit differently. Um, so, so, so this is one. And secondly, the, qu the, the second question was about, sorry, can you say that again? The other Valu part of the question, the valuation, yes. And so that comes back to valuation as well. Um, of course, valuation are being uh, heated. I think uh, uh, it's, it's a time to think more pr practically to, 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 uh, to valuations uh, because exit, exit multiples are actually, uh, there are higher chances that the exit multiples will be uh, lower. It means that the investors that we invest in the latest, in the follow-up rounds, will don't will, won't want to invest on a very high valuation, so they will try to lower the valuation, and that means that investors that are investing right now don't want to get in, uh, in on a too high valuation because otherwise they won't be able to do to do their returns. So this is the reason why valuations are going down, and I think for entrepreneurs. Uh, of course, it depends if the, if the business is growing very fast and if there is a way to, to justify this valuation. But in any case, the acquirer would have less uh, um, cash and less money to be able to acquire and buy companies at a very high price. So that's the reason why everything is going down. Uh, but uh, in the same time, it's for entrepreneurs. I think it's uh, way better to close fast and to, to raise at a lower valuation. And it's better to have, it's better to have uh, and less from a business that is growing and doing well than ha have a big pie of a business that is bankrupt. So it's really a way of uh, finding a priority. All right, um, our time is almost coming to an end, but I'd just like to ask Ketso, in an environment where we, we're talking about less funds being available for early stage businesses with a more focus on uh, growth stage businesses and also very few debt facilities um, being open to businesses during this um, COVID period. Do you, what are, what, are, what are your thoughts around the role of syndicated investments? And do you see a role for high net worth individuals, family offices, angel investors? Um, where should early stage businesses turn to uh, in this period? I mean, I don't understand what, you know, what the circumstances are in, in, in the rest of the world, but in South Africa, I think there's still quite a lot of capital available 
uh, because of our 12J structures, the number of new funds that have been launched, uh, the number of corporates that are now willing to get into the, the venture space. Um, so I think that if the entrepreneur is promoting and pitching a business that people can understand and find attractive and can see how it will contribute in the current environment, I think fundraising is going to be um, relatively easier. I think that the valuation issue is definitely going to be a sticking point. And if I was, I was the entrepreneur, I would rather not get into a valuation discussion and just do convertibles for, for the sort of the intervening period until we have some level of, of, of certainty. I think we are definitely seeing uh, high net worth individuals a lot more sympathetic. I've been trying to raise money for COVID type intervention uh, businesses, producing masks and other things. And I've been overwhelmed by the number of high net worth individuals that want to come to the party. So I think it depends on how relevant the pitch that the entrepreneur is making for the current environment. Uh, you know, I think it will, it will depend very much on that, the ability to raise money in, in this period. All right. And lastly, to Larry, like, what are your thoughts around the support to, towards African startups vis-a-vis -vis other regions, um, Israel and US. I know you have a lot of experience across different parts of the world. I just wanted to see what your, you know, your sentiments are around the support and what can we do better as a, as a continent? Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it, it's, if you ask me in a sentence, it would be early stage funding. Um, if you look at some of the economies that have come out with uh, a lot of successful companies, your unicorns and your big listings and uh, big client bases, major impact. They came from environments that have been um, providing funding and a fertile environment for mentorship and growth from the outset at the time that people have ideas. Um, because from there, we, there seems to be uh, a lot of capital in the later rounds, I think Kenza mentioned that earlier, um, lots of international funds, lots of funds in Africa with big checkbooks in all sorts of currencies. So once you get to the B, C, D round, pre-RPO, there's no shortage of, of funding from Africa and around the world. The, the key for us to get Africa really pumping in this environment across all the sectors is to get private and public money into support of new ideas and, and entrepreneurs that have got great ideas, but just haven't got that early stage uh, funding where people are prepared to take risk on them. I think if we can grow that space, um, we can absolutely fly. All right, so our time is up, unfortunately, and we have quite a number of questions that have come in through the chat box. What we'll do is send this through to the Africa Arena and FFA team, and we'll find a way to address this in future sessions. However, thank you to everybody, to the attendees, and particularly to the panelists for sharing your insights um, and just you know engaging us and um, and highlighting um, all the issues and uh, you know uh, thematic topics um, that are relevant to businesses and investors in the region today. Um, I'd like to hand over this virtual microphone to Loazi Wali and just thank you all. Great, thank you so much Esther for that and thank you everyone for, for weighing in. So, um, hi everyone, I'm really excited to be here. My name is Loazi Wali and I'm Head of Venture Sourcing for Founders Factory Africa and essentially what that means is I lead sort of the sourcing, selecting and qualifying of all the businesses we bring into our venture scale program. So we have a fantastic lineup of founders who will be presenting their businesses today. They represent three sectors that, you know, we believe are still well positioned to grow, even in the current and post COVID environment. I think some of our panelists have also touched on that um, across sort of health tech, logistics and ed tech. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our three founders today. Um, and Sorry, to introduce our three founders today. Um, so um, starting with Victor, who's the CEO of Triplo. Um, Triplo is a SaaS for logistics platform 
that automates and optimizes operations for transporters in Africa. We've also got Patrick, who's the CEO of Redbird, um, a US Ghanaian digital health company, enabling decentralized healthcare on the continent. Um, Redbird has recently released a COVID-19 daily check-in app that actually enables patients to report symptoms from home and hospitals to better protect their staff and, and patients. Um, and last and certainly not least, we've got Velo from um, CEO of Zio, an edtech platform that curates company-specific learning journeys to teach anyone how to code in order to sort of strengthen um, the pipeline of talent for larger organizations. And so in terms of the, quickly, in terms of the format for how things are gonna go, um, it's gonna be very quick. We're gonna have four minute pitches to hear from the founders plus two minutes of Q and A. Um, we ask that everyone sort of keep their microphones on mute throughout the presentation. And you can save those for Q and A um, where we'll all open it up to the audience, but also we've created a, a really interesting dynamic where we're encouraging each of the founders to ask each other questions. Um, um, the chat line will also be open throughout the throughout their presentations and we encourage you all to drop your comments there. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to um, Patrick from Redbird. Hi Patrick, can you hear us? I think you're still on mute. Yes, sorry, I was trying to figure out how to get off mute. I can hear That's you, great. can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you, Lawazi, and uh, thanks, everyone. I am Patrick with Redbird, where we are helping patients avoid unnecessary hospital visits by enabling decentralized digital health monitoring starting in Ghana. Now, to begin, why are we trying to keep people out of hospitals when they don't need to be there? Well, because this is what you experience across most of the continent when you go into a hospital. Uh, you, whether you have a broken arm or whether you need to check up on your blood pressure because you're hypertensive, you end up in the same waiting room and you sit and you wait and you wait. And that is uh, costly because now you're at a hospital. You are also losing a lot of time and therefore income that you could be having. And also something that people are thinking a lot more about now it's not exactly a safe place to be. You don't want to be in a hospital unless you need to be there, especially when you have a pandemic going on. So the question becomes, how can you uh, still give high quality healthcare without requiring people to go into a hospital, especially as chronic disease starts taking off? Well, for Redbird, we leverage existing community pharmacies. And what we do is we take those community pharmacies and we supply them with everything they need to transform themselves into a convenient health monitoring center. So a place five minutes, uh, where sorry, a place right around the corner where a patient can go in, get a test done, get a checkup done, five minutes be on their way, saving them hours of waiting and keeping them safer. What do I mean by everything a pharmacy needs? Well, there's two parts. There's existing rapid diagnostic technology. Every one of our pharmacy partners offers 10 different tests that they can perform in the pharmacy with instant results to the patient. But it's not just that, we also provide them with the software they need to manage this business and enable the patient to start building their health record. So when a patient comes in and gets a test done, they're not just getting a test and throwing the result away, they're building their personal health record so that they have the results over time and they can bring those into the hospital if and when they do need to go into the hospital for actual care. And it's not just in the pharmacies, we also enable patients to access their health record wherever they go. Through our uh, patient app, they can access all the pharmacy testing they've done. They can even input new testing. And this is sort of engagement lets us interact directly with patients, which is something that's been very useful for us in the COVID-19 era as people were in lockdown. So how do we work in uh, diagnostic technology, community health, and digital technology all at once? Well, we do it by having the right team. Each of us as a team member has expertise in that area, and together we have years of experience across Sub-Saharan Africa, especially in West Africa where we're located. And so what has this team done? Well, in about 18 months, a little over 18 months, we've gone from two pilot pharmacies to over 200 pharmacies across Ghana. We have a presence in every one of the four major urban areas in Ghana. And it's not just pharmacies. Our pharmacy partners have grown uh, the patient population 
27,000 patients have registered and tested via the Redbird system. And our revenue is scaled with that because we make our revenue based on a razor razor blades model, which means it scales not with the number of pharmacies, but with the number of tests being performed in the pharmacies. Huge upside potential for us. The future of healthcare is decentralized, convenient healthcare. That was the case before COVID-19. It's the case, COVID-19 has just accelerated people recognizing this. But this has always been the next leapfrog opportunity for Sub-Saharan Africa. And at Redbird, we've already been there and we're leveraging the COVID-19 situation and the interest in decentralized healthcare to make sure that we are the ones bringing that next era of healthcare. Thank you very much and happy to take any questions. Fantastic, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, we'll open it up to the audience for any questions. Great, I think there is still coming through quickly. So I think just maybe, Patrick, if you could give the sense, um, the audience a sense of, in terms of scaling your business in this market, how are you guys thinking about scale, whether that's a geographic point of view or from a product point of view? Sure, uh, we think of it in both ways. Obviously, this is a, a model that we uh, feel strongly can replicate uh, across the continent. And so we look at uh, geographic expansion. That's become a bit more difficult in the current time. So we're taking advantage of what, uh, what are the benefits that uh, COVID-19 is bringing. And so there's a lot of downsides, but when we think of the benefits, we see increased health awareness, increased interest in decentralization, and an increased uh, appreciation of the importance of connecting hospitals and health centers to what's going on at home. You can't just ignore what's happening at home. And so we've looked at how can we leverage our existing technology into these areas, and we're working in all of them uh, including in the hospitals right now, uh, just kicked off a partnership uh, helping a hospital here in Ghana to monitor their staff and their patient population for symptoms related to COVID-19 before they come in so that they can uh, make sure they can continue operating. Great, that's really exciting. Um, we've got a question from um, one of the audience. They want to know how you're thinking about or handling sort of GDPR um, issues. Right, so uh, when we look at the, the healthcare data that we collect, patient privacy become, is first and foremost. And uh, it's, it's not just DDP, GDPR. A lot of the countries uh, across the continent already have data protection acts. They've had them for a long time. Ghana's had theirs since 2012. Uh, so we, we look at uh, the core guiding principle to us is that this is a patient's health record. We want it to follow them wherever they, they go in the healthcare system as long as they want it to. Uh, so every one of our patients has to uh, has to approve a pharmacy before they can access the health record. They have to do that via SMS confirmation. They can take away that access at any time. We separate all uh, personal identifying information from their health records when we're analyzing data so that even internally uh, that's not able to be accessed. Great, that's fantastic. Um, I think does any unless we've got maybe one question for one more. Um, no, it doesn't look like it. I think that's all the time we have for, for Redbird. Thank you so much, Patrick. I um, appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Thank you very much. Great. Um, next up is Victor, who's the CEO of Triplo. Victor, over to you. Hi, I think you're on mute, Victor. Yes, yeah, sorry, um, I was trying to get off mute. Uh, thanks so much, Loazi, uh, much appreciated. So um, my name is Victor Chaiteji, founder and CEO of Triplo. Um, and so I left investing billions of rands in startups and uh, in listed companies to found a logistics operation that um, bought trucks that are servicing SADC countries. So with that, we experienced a lot of uh, problems, which is what led to my partnership with uh, Founders Factory. So research has shown that African economies are losing a staggering $180 billion a year due to logistics inefficiencies, both structural and at a transporter level. And what's actually striking is that over 50% of transporters in South Africa's 
480 billion rand a year market are SME transporters. And that number actually increases as you go outside of South Africa. Sadly, you know, transporters were already experiencing major, major, challenges, major challenges before COVID, and these challenges will worsen, right? Demand rates and profitability will reduce and payment cycles will increase. And this will actually result in a number of transporters having to shut down. With that sad reality, you know, transporters are still very, very important, even post COVID. Imagine not having food or toiletries in the shops on time. And this is actually why transportation of goods has been declared an essential service to deliver food and medical supplies uh, with movement across borders only open to um, car the movement of cargo. So even if brick and motor uh, shops will reduce, logistics will continue servicing um, uh, individuals as well as uh, different sectors, you know, because goods will still need to move from raw materials to manufacturing to the end users, both consumers and businesses, especially now with hunger looming across the most of um, Africa. So to ensure that communities, even in the deepest of rurals in Africa, get their goods they need efficiently and timelessly, AAA is creating a new standard for African road freight by developing a software platform uh, which automates and optimizes operations for transporters in Africa. And we started uh, by creating an affordable and intuitive end-to-end -end software as a service tool for SADC transporters, for them to achieve better efficiencies and profitability in the quest of getting to international standards. So for example, our MyFleet module uh, moves transporters away from manual ways such as in Excel sheets and computer folders to autom in an automated way manage compliance of trucks, trailers, and drivers in one place. Our trip planning um, empowers transporters with detailed critical trip information about their trips across SADAC routes. And they will know exactly how much money they're going to make and what that trip will entail in thorough detail. So within three months uh, of launching our uh, MyFleet product with over 180 assets from two countries in SADAC on the platform, um, the above two of nine modules have been creating a lot of value for transporters as seen by like time savings and compliance improvements. But as we continue delivering value for transporters, the, the current events are actually opening up a new opportunity for us to fast track tools that provide inclusive value, uh, which includes cargo owners and cargo brokers who are vastly impacted as well by COVID. And now if even more than before, um, they need that digital enablement. So we also value our strategic partnership that we've been creating uh, that have been enhancing our value to transporters at the product level, like in the IoT space and in the creative uh, FinTech space. Um, and we are also now starting to look at partnerships um, that will create value for cargo owners and cargo brokers in order for us to change this old industry. So a key aim for Triplo is to level the playing field, right? Where SME transporters in Africa are operating at the same level and standard as the larger transporters um, with advanced freight tech. And we want transporters in Africa to be competing at a global scale. By that time, we, we targeted to have at least 40,000 trucks that are moving at least 45 million kilograms of cargo to every corner of at least 20 African countries. Um, as part of that, we're currently raising, doing our seed funding round uh, with timing for around the end of May to build and commercialize tools that open up that road freight uh, industry um, to include cargo owners and cargo brokers and help logistics transform. So if you're interested in reshaping um, the future of logistics in Africa, please reach out to me at the details above. Thank you.
Great. Thank you so much, Victor, for that. Um, we'll open it up to the audience for a um, for Q and A. I don't know if any questions are coming through. Um, great. We seem to be getting one from the Q and A side. Um, so. In terms of you know e-commerce and this COVID era and post-COVID era, is one of the most um, promising and exciting um, you know trends in 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 the space and growing in in the African continent as well. What role do you see um, Triplo and and products and and other startups in this ecosystem playing in that role um, in terms of scaling it up and opening it up to the rest of the world? So um, a good question. So what, what I'm seeing is that, uh, you know, the brick and mortar has been vastly controlled by the larger players. And now obviously brick and mortar is uh, slowly dissolving, which, you know, where people need goods from manufacturing straight to their home. And with that, we actually are looking to be positioned um, uh, in the near future as a platform that allows the swift movement of goods um, across any part of Africa. And I think that requires uh, a very highly digitally enabled, uh, tech-enabled tech platform, uh, which is safe, which is secure, uh, which de-risks the movement of goods, uh, especially as, as the market opens up from an e-commerce perspective. So we're actually seeing the potential for uh, a platform like this, uh, or other platforms of a similar nature to become some of the biggest logistics platforms in the world, um, moving away from the current large uh, uh, players who are mostly on an asset level. No, great. I think that that's a really interesting point. And I think another interesting point around the business is, is the fact that you chose to, to build a product that sort of supports the driver and not the cargo side of this value chain. Can you talk to us around that decision and, and, and why you all um, chose to start on that side versus, you know, majority of the other players in this market um, are focusing on the supply and cargo side? So what's happening is that uh, technology, especially for logistics, um, is not yet democratized, right? So uh, the larger players can afford to buy a $10 million SAP system, which a 10 truck operation cannot buy. So mm -hmm. what, is, what is then happening is that we, we decided to solve problems on the ground first, right? So the, even the way Triplo started was I started it in my own logistics business where I built a lot of Excel systems and Excel sheets to help me on a daily operational perspective. And we tried it with other small transporters who could not find technology that helps them on the ground. And with that validation, that's where we actually started Triplo, identifying the need that helps um, people from a daily operational perspective. So what you're finding is that uh, you know, whilst other players are playing at the ends, we started to start from the middle uh, because once you give someone a, a, a load, most truck owners lose money. So we're trying to make sure that the middle is efficient first and then we can expand out to, to the ends. Great. I think that's really interesting. I think we've got time for one last question um, from the audience. And that is, how is Triplo planning to leverage Africa's regional trade policies to achieve scale? Um, so I think it's a very good, very good question. And I think the opportunity is ripe more now uh, um, uh, than ever. Um, so for example, obviously with the regional uh, borders, we'll be opening uh, primarily for cargo, for countries to be able to do uh, easy intertrade. So right now it's still a bit uh, structurally, structurally it's a bit difficult. So they're trying to open up the borders. So most people are not even doing cross-border transportation because of those difficulties. But with the borders opening up, uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of uh, potential for us to enable transporters across any region to be able to move to other regions. So for example, right now, if I want to move from South Africa to Tanzania, and I've never been to Tanzania, um, it's very difficult for me to have or even find a platform that helps me plan my 
plan my routes efficiently, make sure that those goods get there on time, which is what we are building currently, where you as a truck owner are able to move to anywhere across the continent that you've never been to because all the information is uh, available to you uh, on, on our platform. So we're seeing that as a very good uh, opportunity, which will open up um, the requirement for efficient transportation that can be enabled by a platform like ours. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for your time, Victor. Um, appreciate it. And um, I think everyone has your details. And um, so we'll move on to the, the final pitch for today. Um, and that's in Velo. Um, Velo, are you there? Great. From Zayo. Hi, Lazim. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to go ahead and start. Um, yeah, okay. so basically at Zayo, we're on a mission to cultivate young leaders that will drive the future of uh, global innovation. So the challenge that we've identified is that there's a really huge mismatch between um, what is being taught in schools as well as boot camps from a coding perspective as well as what is required in the industry. So this basically translates to companies paying a large amount of money and using resources that they don't really have to, um, to upskill the developers once they've taken them into their company, which sometimes lasts between three to six months. This is a high capital cost for them, um, and we're trying to avoid this for them. So the solution is that Zayo is an online platform where we curate customized learning journeys based on the company's specific technology stack, its internal tools, as well as the framework's requirements. So in the learning journey itself, we try as much as possible to simulate the working environment for, for the developers so that even they get a feel of the company culture as well. So our product looks like this. Um, as you can see, there's a profile, there's learning journeys that are specific to the company itself. And um, there's reports generated to how the learners actually learn um, as data is taken um, throughout the entire journey. So the business model is actually quite simple. Um, so depending on to the degree of the customization of the, the learning journey itself, it falls between the range of $14,000 and to $85,000. To date, we've raised um, just north of $50,000 uh, um, from different institutions and angel investors as well as grant funding. Um, we signed up over 3,000 uh, learners that have wanted to, to learn through um, our platform, primarily from UCT, UWC and, and other universities. And then we've also recently partnered with the Youth Employment Service here in South Africa, um, which has allowed us to gain access to just just over 450 corporate companies within the YES network. Um, and within the first week of us being an implementation partner at YES, um, so we, we start doing two programs for, for these companies. And one is taking 25 youth over a 12 month learning program. And then a seven youth are currently in a work readiness program within our company. We then later this year are going to be training just north of 3000 students. Um, and this number will grow every year um, with the targets of reaching 50,000 students a year um, through years. So our ask is actually quite simple. Um, so we're trying to raise around to, to scale, obviously, our operations, as well as move into data science, because there's a huge demand in that space, um, and there's a breakdown of what the, the funds will be going to primarily. And um, moving also just to, to the rest of Africa, as well as Europe, because um, currently one of our campaigns that are very successful right now is DevJam, which have reached people in, in about six continents. So if anyone is really concerned about, you know, their digital transformation in their companies, as well as just the training of developers because of the, the current, current situation that we're in and everyone moving towards, you know, a digitally transformed um, world, I'm 100% keen to have a conversation. Great, thank you so much Mbello. Um, that was really interesting. And you know, you're you're addressing a really core cool issue, especially in this country, with as as you know, skills gap continue to to be a, a consistent problem um, towards um, growth of, of the startup ecosystem and employment. Can you just talk us through from a point of view of Zio, um, how you guys are one thinking about scale? and how you sort of curate both sides of that marketplace, meaning people who are looking 
um, to join and and um, learn how to code and how you then match them to corporates, whoever's looking for that talent? Um, so from a scaling point of view, um, just answered quite quickly, just how Patrick answered. So there's obviously the, the technical elements of it. So we're constantly updating our platform. We're actually due to, to release another version of it in the next two months, just to help us with capacity and um, the number of people. And then from the getting the candidates themselves, um, we've primarily worked through partners within the university spaces. Um, so that's your UCTs, that's your VITs, that's your um, UWCs as well. And then in terms of, you know, getting clients, um, so we've worked through different channels, um, one of them being the launch lab at um, Stellenbosch and then more recently, uh, yes. So in terms of matching the candidates themselves, um, we usually just ask the clients, what kind of candidates do you want? Do you want somebody who has never coded before? Do you want somebody who has some sort of prior experience? And then based on the, the, the content that they want us to teach as well. We then find the best suited candidates who will learn quickly um, through you know, our vetting process, which is a three-step process, and then we get the best candidates for them so that they can be successful through the journey and get placed in the company. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to see if anyone else in the audience has questions. Um, I think there's some interest from the audience around partnerships with Zio. Can you talk to just how someone can um, partner with, with Zio, how, what type of partnerships you're looking for, and how customers on both sides can find you um, in terms of opportunities to work together? Um, so currently, um, the partnerships that we are looking for is obviously the increase of sales and you know, gaining market share, um, especially in places outside of South Africa, that will be really good. Um, but also, you know, just from a capabilities point of view, we are trying to increase the capability within the team itself um, from a, a tech perspective as well as operations perspective. So those are the areas that I would, you know, highlight as areas that we would be willing to partner in. Fantastic. And then I think the last question, can you talk us through how um, Zio plans to monetize this model to scale? Are you making revenue today? And, or is this more of an impact focus for now with commercial um, plans in the future? Um, so it is actually a revenue generation, um, revenue generating, sorry. Um, and we're, we're operating at a profit. So we charge the companies that are looking to make their pipeline more robust. And then the learning journey itself is free for the users. So we, we charge the companies in essence. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for your time today. This was really exciting. And, you know, congratulations on, on building a, a business that is solving a really key problem for, for not only our country, but I think the continent at whole. So thank you very much for your time. I look forward to speaking soon. Thank you. I think that's all from, from us on the pitch side. So I'll hand it back over to uh, Valentin and Rajiv to, to sort of recap and, and close out um, today's session. So thank you all, and thank you to the founders for joining. Thank you, Gwazi, and thank you, everybody. Uh, especially big congratulations to, to the founders that have been an amazing job, and it was super insightful to hear insights from you. Uh, big up to Gwazi for coordinating this uh, pitching session. That's, that was only the first one, and we are going to have the chance to have a second pitching session in a week. Give me just one second to share with you. So the second pitch, so this is a series of uh, three events, as what you have explained a bit before, and we are very lucky to have an additional event next week. So if you would like to join, we've set up a platform as part of an African Digital Collective Africa Arena, Founders Factory, but like so many VCs, uh, incubators, accelerators across the continent. One of the initiatives we are trying to make together is to facilitate access to capital for startups that need it in this uh, challenging period. So we set up a, a specific level and a community on the Euroquity platform, which is very used to connect investors with startups. You can access the platform by clicking on, uh, by uh, copying the link, uh, bit.ly uh, slash Bridge Africa. On this platform, um, Founders Factory, Africa and Africa Arena, we are going to select at the end of uh, this week, beginning of next week, 
four startups that are going to pitch during our next event on the same format as, uh, as the one we just had. But besides that, uh, the startups that are going to be part of this community are going to be able to get visibility from investors. Uh, we are trying to, uh, we are inviting various investors uh, based in Africa, but not only to have a look at this platform and to have a look at the promising businesses that are on it and that are looking to, to raise funding at the moment. So I feel very welcome to join uh, the community. On a side note, we got, uh, what you've presented Africa Arena very well at the beginning, uh, but I would like to give a bit more insight as we are very proud to, uh, we have probably released our report the last week to an event that you can uh, see on uh, Facebook on the Africa Arena page. As you have been scouting the continent over the three last years uh, through open innovation challenges, uh, we've been organizing uh, events in the biggest tech hubs such as uh, Nigeria, such as uh, in West Africa, in South Africa, in North Africa as well. Uh, we've met tons, thousands of uh, very great founders, uh, incubators, managers, uh, policy makers, and we wanted to uh, explain uh, what we've learned from that, what are the key insights and what's happening in the state of tech in Africa in 2019. What are the key highlights in terms of investment, in terms of uh, enjoy investment of corporate innovations or big companies working with startups. So I invite you, if you would like to know more, to go to uh, the website and have a look and feel very welcome to give us some feedback on this report. And last but not least, so this was the second part of the event. First week was about hearing from uh, inc incredible founders and investors that are adapting their businesses the current situation. Now we took a step back today to think about how the investment landscape is currently changing across Africa and uh, how is the relationship between GPs and LPs is changing. But next week we are going to take a much more, much more long-term prospect and uh, invite investors, but not only, that are taking some collective initiative across the continent to facilitate VC investment. What we figured out with some of the partners is that uh, practices in the venture capital space may vary quite a lot between investors. They don't know each other very well in some part of the continent. As well, a uh, term sheet or requirement for due diligence may change quite a lot. And various stakeholders are doing an amazing work across the continent to solve that problem. So we are very proud with Founders Factory to invite these stakeholders next week to join an event and that will be followed by four pitches from amazing startups where if there are some investors in the room, I strongly suggest to invest in. So to close this event, I will just say a big thank you to everybody. First, to the panelists, thank you very much for joining and sharing your insights. A special big up to Esther for animating this discussion. Thank you very much to the founders of these great startups and for OSC to animating, as well as Wajif for presenting and coordinating. And uh, thank you above all to all the attendees that took part in this conference. Uh, we're going to send you resources that have been discussed and uh, feel free to apply if you're a startup or an investor to join the, the, Euro, the Euro Creative Platform that we uh, previously mentioned. And have a great day, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>